Now, uh, we bring in Financial Phil, Phil McCoy from Ameriprise Financial and the Marius Group of Financial Advisors on Winchester Avenue in Martinsburg. And Phil, I've got to prepare you. Gilstrap watched the Super Bowl <laughs> yesterday. He's ready to talk some football with us. I'm ready, man. I am ready. All right, let's start with the Super Bowl before we get into money. All right, let's uh, first and foremost... It was a great game. It, it was uh, wonderful to watch. Uh, two great quarterbacks going at it. Young quarterbacks were going to be around for a long time, it would seem. And uh, a couple of really solid teams. And the Chiefs, on the will of Patrick Mahomes, who didn't have great stats compared to Jalen Hurts of Philadelphia, uh, found a way to pull that one out. Their defense made an opportunistic big play. Their special teams came up with a huge punt return. And Mahomes was just enough Mahomes to get it done, Phil. Yes, and those were the two plays. You know, where everybody's talking about the the defensive holding call at the end of the game, and but there was also the huge punt return, and there was also a fumble recovery for a touchdown. That game could have been out of hand had it not been for that defensive touchdown that the Chiefs had gotten in the first half. So you know that it it did come down to that third. I think it was third and eight, and a defensive holding call. I don't necessarily like the rule, but he did hold him, and he said afterwards he held him. So the rule is the rule, and and it ended up being a cheap swing. It's kind of anticlimactic because they just ran the clock out and kicked the field goal. I really wanted them to block that, and I had as the week had gone on, I became more and more of a Jalen Hurts stand. I really liked his 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 background, and you know, seeing that how he got benched at Alabama and he stayed true to the team. He didn't pout, and he kind of helped uh, uh, Tua along through the national championship game. So. I became a fan of his as it went on. But man, he played incredible. Had they won that game, he probably that would have been one of the best performances by a quarterback in Super Bowl history. Maybe I mean it was a huge game that he had, rushing and throwing. It was, a, it was, but it was a good game overall. It was a good game. I was satisfied with the game, except for the end. I really wanted to see the Chiefs have, have, or the Eagles have to go down in in a minute and of twenty five seconds or so to see if they could score. And I think they would have. I really do. Those receivers uh, were something else. You know, Brown and she, I forget the little guy's name, but they were they were they were on fire. So, but it was a good game overall. All right, I like to reward effort, and Gilstrap made the effort. So I want to hear from you now, John. I want to talk about the officiating. The, there were, I think, it was three. Oh, John. Three. Now, come on. <laughs> I disagreed with all three of the controversial reception calls. I thought that in, in, when they said the guy did have, and I'm not going to get the names right because I, I don't study it that deeply, but having control of the ball is having control of the ball. And, and I thought that in, in the two cases where it was ruled that he did not have control, he did. And in the one where they ruled that he did not have control, or the other way around. Um, I, you know, I, I think. What are your thoughts? I, the whole business of of stopping the momentum of a game for these reviews from upstairs, I, I think, is is a problem. Well, I like the way that college does it. They do it quickly, and they've got someone up in the booth that's doing it. And, and if they need more time, they'll slow the game down just for a second so it doesn't turn into a three-, four-, five-minute pause and everybody in the world get to, to watch and, and insert their opinion but I think college gets it right, and I think college inserts more common sense into it as well, and they, they kind of let uh, common sense be their guide in some cases. But, you know, there's, there's bad calls, and that's one of my pet peeves. There's bad calls in almost every game. But, you know, I, had, you know, I have a friend that he's already clamoring about the defensive holding, saying, hey, it wasn't even catchable. But we don't really know if it was catchable, because if he wasn't holding, Juju may have been out there to, to catch the ball. But there's calls that go both ways, and those things wash out. Had it not been for the punt return, they wouldn't have been in that situation. Had it not been for the fumble by Hurts, I don't even think he was hit. He just squared the ball, just squared it out. But had it not been for the fumble in the first half return for a touchdown, there may not have been in that situation anyway. But but by and large, it was it was a good game. I have no issues with the officials. I know they're going to miss calls. That's part of the deal. And, and but it, it but it tends to wash out. They have no. They have no desire, one way or the other, to put themselves on a national stage for missing a call. You know, and so it's it's the human element into it, just like the players. It's the human element, and it normally just washes out. I want to address the one comment your friend made, Phil, and that was it was an uncatchable ball, and and these are the the kind of things that, and I guess you could blame it on the NFL for splitting hairs with rules and penalties and what what affects a penalty on one call but not another. 
But they're on a defensive holding penalty, there is no such thing as an uncatchable ball rule. That's strictly for pass interference. Correct. Pass interference Correct. is while the ball is in the air. Holding, if you hold a player before the ball is thrown, that is not considered pass interference. It's considered holding because the ball's not in the air. If it's holding and it's not on, on a, then the pass isn't in the air yet, it can't be an uncatchable ball because the ball hasn't been thrown. Agreed. Next. Well, and I, Next. I, I, no, don't go yet. Don't go yet. <laughs> I want to go one more, one more on this. If you're at a high school game and the ball is thrown 50 feet over the guy's head and he's interfered with and the ref throws the flag and says pass interference and you're standing around at a high school game screaming, but it was an uncatchable ball. Stop screaming that because you're just showing your ignorance of the rule. There is no such thing as an uncatchable ball in high school football when it comes to pass interference. The rules are interpreted and written differently for high school, which has a, a, a predominant approach on the safety of the player as opposed to professional, which is totally different. Safety of the player is a little bit further down the line on, a, on, a, on pass interference. Okay, But in high school, there is no uncatchable ball rule. Interference is interference is interference, and it's not subject to an uncatchable ball. So don't scream that at high school games anymore. That's a pet peeve of mine. All right. Now moving on, I Phil, you can go. At high games. <laughs> no, I was going to point out, and I heard an interview, I think I told you this this morning, with Ben Roethlisberger because he had an abundance of Pittsburgh of defensive holding. And what he had said is as he went through his progression and someone's coming out of the break, if he saw or thought that the defensive back was tugging on that receiver, he threw the ball that way. And he threw it as so it wouldn't be intercepted because he knew or he thought that defensive holding could be called. He would throw it so it couldn't be intercepted. But he did go that way because it's more likely that it's going to be called if it's thrown to that receiver. And I don't know if Pat Mahomes did that or not or if he, he had that wherewithal to do that. But the second he threw the ball, he started pointing at Juju and said he was holding him. So that could have just been a very heads-up play by Pat Mahomes. I don't like the rule. I think it's a little severe that you hold a receiver out of the break and it's, a, it's an automatic first down. I think that's a bit severe, but it is the rule. So it, and, and they, they have to call it, as you pointed out, with Cincinnati hitting Pat Mahomes out of bounds just the, the, a few weeks before, you've got to call it regardless of the time of the game. You can't say, oh, man, this is the Super Bowl and it was third and eight and that's just too big of a moment to call that ticky-tack play. You have to call it. So it is what it is, and, you know, and some of the catches, as John alluded to, I don't know. So I don't, I don't know that I know enough because it's so hard to determine what's a catch. I just go back to common sense, and if it was a catch when I was a little boy in my backyard, it's a catch there, and, and to me, they all look like catches. So I, I don't, I don't know that um, you know I have an opinion either way on the catches. But that you know, it did take a, it did take away from the game because you didn't get the excitement of the drive. You knew after that was called that they could run the clock almost all the way down kick what amounts to be an extra point and the game is over and and that's what happened so you know but all, all, all in all it was a good game I thought it was played well by both I wanted as the week went on I didn't really care I mean honestly I don't really care because it wasn't the Steelers but as the week went on I became a Jalen Hurts fan so I kind of wanted them to win but I didn't lose any sleep over it. The NFL reception rule is somehow they've identified a third foot that people have because you have to have three feet down yeah, I didn't did notice that. You had to get one, two. Now it's three. I thought it was two, you but got, whatever. Yeah, it, I, can't, I can't keep up with the catch rule. It's three to, in terms of how they determine whether it's a catch or, or not a catch when you see a fumble involved. It's two when you're trying to stay in bounds, but it's three if you're going to fumble the ball and it's incomplete or fumble. <laughs> like I say, they have only themselves to blame for confusing everybody because of how convoluted their rules are about things. Good. But, with experience with the, the running back from Philadelphia when he got hit, if that's the one we're talking about, yeah. I knew immediately that wasn't going to be called a catch. Correct. I don't know why I knew that. I guess just because from experience from watching, and everybody else knew it wasn't going to be called a catch as well. Right. But, uh, but you know, in, he didn't in have my a third backyard, foot. I guess. In my backyard, though, that looked, you know, when they slowed it down, yes. I was like, hey, that's a catch. Also but, true. You know, with NFL rules, you, you, have to, you have to hold, possess, and apparently feed the ball before it's a catch any, anymore and, and not touch the ground at all at any point for the rest of the night in order for it to be a catch. But it's, it's strange because that's the only rule that favors the defense. The rest of the rules now all favor True. the offense, except for we're going to make it incredibly hard 
can make a really tough catch. Correct. We'll make it even harder. No. Officiating is part of the fabric of the game. And all it of is. us like to come uh, if, But that's the one part of the game that we can get, a, get around if we choose to, and that's with artificial intelligence. We can have the algorithms written, so take the officials totally off the game, uh, out, off the field. I hope that never happens, but we have the capability of doing that. But let me pick up the point that has not been mentioned that I think deserves a lot of credit, and that's Pat Mahomes himself. He left the going, he went into halftime, hurt him. And I, it looked like he was obviously hurting. Nobody expected him to come back. Not only did he come back, he came back and played a brilliant second half. He did. Yeah. And yeah, uh, gusty performance. Yeah. It, was, it was gusty. It's a Super Bowl, man. Adrenaline takes over. And I, I, I knew he'd come back. I just didn't know that if he would be mobile or not. But apparently – now, I don't know if he was as mobile. That long run he had – Man, those are some short steps. It looked like Benny Hinn running down the middle. <laughs> of the but, or Benny Hill, I mean. The, uh, I knew you, man. But, uh, but, yeah, the, but he was uh, – it was a gutsy performance. But, man, I, I, I still go back to Jalen Hurts. He played so well and put up so many. He did. How many fourth and third and shorts did he just grind through and just gut through and get those? And what he had, 300 yards passing, 80 yards rushing, and – Four total touchdowns and an extra point, something like that. Do you see the performance for him? Do you see the NFL addressing this uh, fourth and short phenomenon that's developed since they took away the yes. call about aiding the runner? It used to be you couldn't push yes. the runner forward, but now it's okay. So what yeah. teams have done on on quarterback sneak is they've changed their philosophy. Right, so you just line up a couple of people in the backfield, and then they just run right into the back of the quarterback and surge everybody forward. So stopping a fourth and one now is pretty darn difficult. Yeah, and both yeah, it's really hard. Both teams are known for their ability to sack the quarterback. There was only one sack last night, and that was a lame call. And I mean, that was a lame call, exactly right. Yeah. And because he one yard short when he ran out of bounds. Yeah, but that was quite. They were expecting a lot of pressure, a lot more pressure on the quarterbacks, a lot more sacks than actually happened. Yeah, Philadelphia's defense was neutered. That's right. And as was Kansas City to some degree. So credit is to the offensive line in both cases. And the QBs. Who get offensive are lines travel like defenses. Yeah. Get offensive yeah. lines travel. Phil, we the are looking, we're we're looking for some financial numbers uh, this morning. A CPI, PPI right now. Market futures are slightly positive. We are still 40 minutes away from the opening bell. What are these numbers going to do for us this week? Uh, it's data driven, you know, and, and Drone Powell had told us that we got a quarter of a percent increase, and then he as much said he said he didn't expect that we would decrease it all this year, but he didn't shut the door on it, and then said, "Hey, we're going to be data driven." And we touched on this briefly this morning. One of the issues, or one of the fears, our markets have had is a very strong labor market, and not that that's a bad thing, but it's an inflationary pressure. But it's starting to seep into some investors' minds. What if we can get inflation down significantly without injuring the labor market too much? And that has been a very positive thought. And we've continued to get positive labor market news as far as unemployment rates and et cetera. So if we get another CPI rating that the, the, the pace of disinflation continues to go down, man, we could – tomorrow – I think it's tomorrow that CPI can, I think. Um, now – have to cushion the CPI number because I've long wondered why is CPI the one that tends to move our markets and get most of the headlines and I've come up with an answer it's the first one typically uh, the Federal Reserve says hey we look at the PCE the most but the the first indicator tends to be the CPI and everything else kind of follows that so we get all of our excitement out after that and then the rest of them just we kind of know what they are after after the CPI numbers come out but if that CPI, and I think it's tomorrow, I could be wrong, but if it's uh, – now, now I'm worried. I want to know when it's coming out. But, the, <laughs> but when that number comes out, it could be a huge mover of our markets. And it's going to mean more than anything that an individual company in the short term, individual company earnings, we always revert back to that, as John says, eventually we'll revert back to that. But in the short term – and the direction of our market. Can we sustain this run that we've had since October? You know, all the attention is on this year so far, last week notwithstanding, but on, on this year is done really well. But this really started back in October. And if you look at your portfolio from that point, from October moving forward, 
you've seen some pretty decent games in there. Even though last week was pretty rough, you should have seen some pretty decent games. Can we continue on that path, or will it be like mid-August where we give it all back and, and quickly so we did it in mid-August? Which way will we go? I feel better about this more recent run because it is longer lasting. You know, what we gave back in August was only six weeks, but now we're looking at since back to October 1st. So this week's data is going to be very important. Phil, the CPI report comes out tomorrow at 8.30, and the PPI report comes out Thursday at 8.30. Great. I, I, so I was right. Good. But, uh, yeah, tomorrow's going to be a big day, and especially pre-market. So it'll be worth everyone watching to see what that number looks like. And it's not necessarily the number, but what is that number in relation to what we expect? And, and, and I've seen a couple different expectations, so I don't really know what our markets expect, but it's expected to decrease. Now, will it decrease more than what we thought or less than what we thought? That will be the initial burst of our, of our numbers, and then we'll dig down into them, you know, because there's all these different sectors that go into that CPI number. So we'll dig down into it a little bit, and then we'll see some sector movement or asset class movement based off of what those individual numbers look like. The, a comment on the uh, uh, Facebook uh, was from a, our expanding audience in South in Charleston, South Carolina. Sweet, he is. Uh, he's gotten so he he follows you on a daily basis, Rob, to find out what's going on. Uh, as far as the sectors go, um, Phil, what sectors do you see emerging at this time? Well, what we have seen emerging. This has been since last year, so it's not necessarily recent. But energy has done extremely well through 2022 and even still so this year, but the tech sector, which gave up the most. And when we say the tech sector, or another way to say it is large cap growth, or another way to say it is mainly NASDAQ. That's why the NASDAQ has done so well this year uh, in relationship to the other indices and so poorly last year in relation to the other industries. But it is tied closer to the movement of the interest rate because most growth companies that are Uh, our tech sector as well but most growth companies don't pay dividends so they're impacted more by the movement of interest rates to the good and to the bad so let's go all the way back to april may june of 2020 when our markets had done so well well most of that was in the tech sector and we can look at those fang stocks where we used to talk about fang stocks all the time and how well they were doing well those were the ones that actually struggled the most in 2022 so far in 2023, they kind of led the way based off of the movement of the interest rates. And when, when, is, when is the Federal Reserve going to pause or even pivot? pivot? It's been suggested that they're not saying that they were, they're going to pivot in 2023, but some market participants think that they will pivot, and that would benefit the growth sector or technology sector the most. Look at the P.E. ratios fill in different sectors energy pe ratios are insanely low right now when you consider how overpriced the rest of the market was for so long yeah and that's a fundamental analysis that sometimes we'll revert back to and it goes and and i'll I'll use that with the tech sector as well we only care about it when we want to support a reason to buy or sell but we look at fundamental analysis with pe ratios and multiples it's trading a multiple of this or a multiple of that we tend not to really care if we want to purchase it unless we're looking for a reason to support that decision or if a mutual fund manager or someone that that deals in that sector is looking for a reason to support their bull or bear case. And it kind of goes along with technical analysis as well. So remember, fundamental analysis looks at how much is a company making, what's their balance sheet look like. Technical analysis looks at last time this happened, this is what our markets have done. And some people have discounted technical analysis a little bit. As we mentioned both of those, I'll revert back to the efficient market hypothesis that says neither one of those is worth a pile of beans. And at the end of the day, the market knows it all, and you can't beat the market whether you're using technical or fundamental analysis. 20 years or so ago, I I remember being told by investment advisors that a well-balanced portfolio will double itself uh, you know, taking a longer view on it, it will double itself every seven to 10 years. Uh, and of course, that was 20 years ago. Now that we're in these volatile markets, what do you tell new clients to expect? What's a decent return over a five or 10 year period these days? 
That's a, that's good that you bring that up because it goes back to that efficient market hypothesis, and that's referred to as the rule of seventy two, and that says, hey, look, if you get what if it multiplies, if you're getting a return of nine percent, you'll double your money in eight years. So it just depends on how aggressive you are. But overall, and like you like you just mentioned, we we do look at long term and not short term. It's kind of hypocritical because we're always talking about short term. Last quarter, last year, this week, last week. In reality, we're looking at the bigger picture. And if you look at the bigger picture on a balanced portfolio, and it depends on that balance. You know, what do you mean by balance? Is that 60-40? Is that 50-50? Mean one, you know, the left side of that equation being equities and the right side being bonds. Uh, 65-35 or someone that's really aggressive or young or, or doesn't need their money. They may outlive, they know they're going to outlive their money. They could be an 80-20, 80%. So that those types of portfolios, have that would indicate how long that's why they that uh, investment advisor gave you that range of seven to ten years because it depends or five to ten years it depends on how aggressive you're invested but we we do still buy into that theory but it's dependent upon how you're invested and were you disciplined enough to stay the course through periods like last year if you weren't disciplined enough that won't come true for you because what you'll end up doing in almost every circumstance, you're going to sell on the very worst day or you're going to buy on the very worst day. So stay disciplined to who you are in that balanced portfolio. And time has shown us, it has shown us time and time again that that does work out. I have a book on my shelf at home. I think it came out in 2008 or 2009. And the, and the title is something like The 20,000 Dow. You know, as as the thing that can never happen. You know, is this is you it sure possible? it wasn't thirty thousand? <laughs> no, it was twenty. Because I, I remember was, a book, was, but that was the thirty thousand that was impossible to get to. But so here we are, and I think taking the longer view. I remember when um, you know in the nineties when we first my first four hundred one k times and, and and all of that. I think the Dow was dancing in, in mid sixes, sixty three hundred, sixty five hundred, something like that. So the long view is is much more encouraging, I think, than the daily notice of of market fluctuations. I agree 100%, and I feel more confident in the long run. I don't feel confident all of the next quarter, the next week, the next month, or even in the next year. But in the long view, I absolutely feel confident because, we've been, again, we've been shown time and time again that if you're diversified, something's going to make money, and you just have to be there to make it and not insert any emotion into it. And that's always the hard part. Don't put your own emotion into it, whether it's political or otherwise. Do not insert your own emotion into it because it doesn't work out. Phil, how do we get in touch with you the rest of today? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. All right, Phil, so we are uh, at the end of, uh, what, mid-February and beginning of September, six and a half months from now. They kick off the NFL season. Give me the score of the first game of the Steelers season <laughs> for 2023. They're going to win 19-16, to 16, just like this year. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Phil, thank you very much. Much appreciated, as always.